So, so far you've survived almost one and a half days of this wonderful conference, uh, so congratulations. Uh, we still have a bit of a, a hike to go, but uh, making wonderful observations and progress. Um, hello, uh, my name is Doreen Weisenhaus, and I'm director of the Media Law and Policy Initiative at Northwestern University in Chicago, and I also teach uh, global freedom of expression uh, and the press at both the law and journalism schools there, so I'm always happy to come here to Columbia, where I can meet many of my colleagues and friends, share ideas, talk about cases, but most importantly, how to plan ahead for the battles that are before us. Now, our panel for today is called Around the World in Seven Decisions, but unfortunately, we have to rename it to Around the World in Six Decisions. Uh, one of our panelists, um, Manir Ahmadi of Afghanistan, was not able to get his visa approved in time by the US consulate, uh, so therefore he could not attend the conference. But I, please bear with me for a moment because I'd like to give him a bit of a shout out because he's done some very impressive work. And a little bit later after we're done with our panels, uh, Toby, who has been working with Manir, will uh, address some of the things that they have been working on. Some of us know uh, Manir as a young and accomplished media lawyer in his country, and he's the media law and policy program manager at Internews Network and a legal trainer for the Afghan Independent Bar Association. He's written books on media law, he teaches at Parwan University, and since 2013 he has led um, and coordinated uh, the Price Media Law Moot Court competition teams from Afghanistan and has coached a number of the teams there. Uh, he is a practitioner who has contributed to the drafting and advocating of uh, efforts and laws on media law, access to information and internet policy in Afghanistan, and what he told me was that he wanted to talk about today that while there haven't been many um, free expression in media cases in the courts in Afghanistan, as more cases are settled uh, politically, he did want to discuss a very serious issue which we touched on uh, considerably yesterday, and that is violence against journalists. Last year in 2017, 15 journalists and media workers were killed. Um, so he would have been happy to hear about some of the positive developments on this issue um, had he been here yesterday. But later on, Toby will fill us in on some of the other um, extrajudicial work that's been going on. So moving forward, our panelists here will present a key recent decision from their respective jurisdiction and explain its importance and implications for freedom of expression in their region of the world or perhaps beyond. Now, we didn't tell them to pick a negative or a positive case, but they all picked positive cases. So I think that will make Agnes very happy um, that we do have some good news to look at. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers um, to recognize their efforts for being on the ground and uh, really pushing forth on some of these battles in the trenches. Uh, quickly, uh, our first speaker uh, to my immediate left, your right, is Dario Milos. Many of you know him from prior conferences. He's from South Africa. And he is a partner in the law firm of Weber Wenzel and a visiting professor at Wits University in Johannesburg, where he teaches media law, access to information, and privacy law. He has acted for the media in numerous high profile cases, many of which you have followed, including the famous defamation case brought by the former President Zuma against the cartoonist Zipiro. And he's been a lead attorney in many of the media cases uh, decided by the South African court, and he was involved as an intervener in the case that he's going to be addressing today. Um, uh, next is uh, Karuna Nundi, again, someone that uh, you all know is an advocate at the Supreme Court of India, and she is a uh, recognized international human rights lawyer. She has served as a legal policy advisor to governments, United Nations, companies, civil society movements, and has argued against unconstitutional restrictions on online speech before the Supreme Court of India. Um, okay. 
we had a little switch of seats here. Okay, Tas uh, Gasparian uh, is a media lawyer in Brazil and has served as chief of staff of the Ministry of Justice and a member of the board of directors of the Association of Advocates uh, of Sao Paulo and is a member of the Brazilian Copyright Association. Her practice focuses on consulting and litigation, especially on freedom of speech. Next is Isaf Ben Khalifa, also a human rights lawyer in Tunisia, and serves as the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, in that country. She has supported civil society organizations working on women's rights by defending women subjected to sexual and domestic violence and has taught courses on human rights. Okay. And then Umar uh, Ghilani of Pakistan is a partner of the Law and Policy Chambers and an advocate of the High Court of Pakistan. He has worked with the Supreme Court there and has held research positions at the Federal Judiciary Academy and the Prime Minister's Legal Reform Committee. And finally, last but not least, is Richard Danbury, who's a barrister and former journalist with the BBC, uh, teaches investigative journalism at uh, De Montfort University in Leicester, and is a consultant for the Oxford Program on Comparative Media Law and Policy, where he also has worked for the Price Media Law Moot Court Competition. I think many of us uh, share um, those duties. Um, so what we have here represented are cases from South Africa, India, Tunisia, Pakistan, and Brazil, and Richard will talk about a case from the European um, Court of Human Rights. Um, after our panelists have had a chance, we will have a couple of other updates from um, members uh, in the audience. So, as I said, you'll be pleased to know that these are mostly positive results, and the presentations will address those areas. But um, these cases, uh, really travel the range of different kinds of cases from the broadcast of court trials, a landmark case in privacy, journalistic news gathering during demonstrations, whether an LGBT NGO can operate its own web radio, the legality of mobile network shutdowns, and censorship of the news media for publishing hacked information of the First Lady of, of that country. So um, really looking forward to these um, uh, recitation of these cases and learning lessons and themes of what we can follow from beyond that. So our first up is Dario. Thanks very much, Doreen. And thanks, Agnes Hawley. It's an honor to be here again and to address you. Um, I'll be speaking about an important case on open justice in <coughs> South Africa. Um, before I get to the actual case, I thought I would just have a, uh, mention a few points by way of context in relation to open justice. And that is that there are f have been four developments in recent years. The first of about five or six years ago was our constitutional court recognizing open justice, which is of course a very powerful common law principle that courtrooms have to be open to the public. The Constitutional Court recognized that as a constitutional right. Um, and it did so pretty much on the same basis that the Australian courts recognized freedom of communication as an implied constitutional right. And strategically, that is uh, very important and created a lot of space for litigation because it meant that there was a constitutional right that we could litigate on, the right of open justice, even though it's not uh, numerated as a right in our constitution, like freedom of expression. And the court said it is based on freedom of expression and the right of people, the public, to receive information and ideas. The second important contextual point that I'd like to mention is that our courts then rapidly held that this principle of open justice, which quintessentially applies to courts, can also apply to tribunals and any adjudications which involve public interest. So for example, when a very senior prosecutor was facing a disciplinary inquiry um, from the prosecuting authority, and she alleged it was politically motivated because she wanted to prosecute um, our former president, and it, it's really great to be able to say our former president, Jacob Zuma. Um, that, was, that was something that took place in public, even though it was an internal disciplinary hearing and not a court proceeding. Third important contextual principle is a couple of years ago, the same judge who decided the case I'm, I'm going to talk about shortly, Judge Ponnen, 
also decided that open justice means that documents that are filed have to be made available to the public. And that was very important because until then, until court cases began in public, you couldn't access the court documents and the media was often fobbed off. But what the judge said is that from the moment they are filed, the public is entitled and the media are entitled to access the court documents. Um, and that means if the case never, in fact, goes ahead because it's settled, etc., you can still get access to the court documents. Um, so another important principle. This leads me to the fourth development, which is broadcasting and streaming the courts. And that is the case I'm going to talk about today. It's a recent case of our Supreme Court of Appeal. A, a little bit of history. Um, it was the case that um, from about five years ago or so, Increasingly, judges were allowing cameras in their courtrooms, but for very limited purposes, mainly for the delivery of judgments, and then also increasingly for appeal hearings or applications. These are cases, those of you familiar with the system of law, where advocates or attorneys argue the case, but there are no witnesses who give evidence and who are cross-examined. So the argument was that having cameras in those kinds of cases is far more um, palatable, far more acceptable than having cameras where there are trials and where witnesses are under scrutiny. Live witnesses, as I call them. Not that that means that, uh, you know, that, that, that dead witnesses uh, ever give evidence. Um, that changed in the Oscar Pistorius case, which is the picture at the bottom of, of, of the slide. And that was, of course, in 2013, the famous, infamous now, Paralympian Oscar Pistorius murdered his girlfriend on Valentine's Day. Um, he's currently serving 13 years in jail for the murder. And I was involved on behalf of broadcasters in bringing an unprecedented application to televise the criminal trial. And I spoke about this case a couple of years ago at the conference. Um, and it was a groundbreaking decision for its time. What the court crafted was a negotiated regime whereby there was television or broadcasting of any witness who didn't object. And for those witnesses who did object to being broadcast, including Oscar himself, there was audio. They didn't consent to audio, but the court said that was a good way to balance the right of, the, of fair trial versus the right to open justice and freedom of expression. Um, and of course, the court gave the presiding judge the ultimate discretion. Although that was a groundbreaking decision, because it was the first live broadcast of a criminal trial in South Africa, there were two limitations. The one is that it was a provincial decision of our Gauteng province. Um, that meant that it wasn't binding on other provinces in South Africa. And indeed, quite soon after the Oscar case, there was an application to de televise a high-profile trial in another province, which was rejected. The second point about um, the Oscar Pistorius case is of course it, it was a negotiated regime uh, based on audio being the compromise. And that wasn't of course giving full effect to the right to open justice. Then in January 2015, there was a gruesome murder in the Cape province where a, a man wielding an ax murdered a mother and a father, their 22 year old son and um, seriously injured the 16, their 16-year-old daughter, who was left for dead. The 20-year-old uh, second son of the parents was unscathed, didn't suffer any injuries. And within a few months, he was arrested for the murder of his parents and his brother. I should say that his sister recovered uh, miraculously, but she has retrograde amnesia and doesn't recall anything from that, from that evening. So you can imagine that that kind of case with that, those sort of gruesome facts taking place uh, in the Cape province, the murders occurring in a very famous, um, expensive Gulf estate would attract headlines in South Africa. And indeed, the matter attracted massive public interest. The defense of Henry van Breda, who's the, the brother who was accused of the murder, was that there was an intruder who he was very lucky to um, escape from, and he witnessed the intruder murdering the rest of his family. The case has been going on for the last two months. Judgment is reserved, and the judge has indicated he'll give judgment in about three weeks' time. I predict that Henry van Breda will be found guilty from some of the evidence that was led, 
um, including the fact that there were hardly any break-ins ever in that security state, which prompted the judge to remark that the uh, perpetrator would have to be someone with the skills of a character from the movie Ocean's Eleven to get into the secure golf estate. But what was important from an open justice point of view is on the first day of the trial, the media applied to televise the case. And the judge held that the entire case could be televised, including the evidence of Mr. Van Breda, who opposed it, and so did the prosecutors. There was then an urgent appeal by the accused, Van Breda, and the prosecutors to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And that's also where we, were in, we got involved for an amicus, um, the media monitoring group of South Africa. And the judge began the judgment, Judge Ponnen, with the words, TV, TV or not TV, that is the question. <laughs> and for those of you, and I'd commend reading the judgment, um, it's on my blog, there's a link to it. It's really an incredible, I call it a master's thesis on the right to broadcast court proceedings. Because in the space of the 30 odd page judgment, and within three weeks of hearing the case, the judge produced an incredible piece of, of work um, ultimately holding that as a default position, all cases in South Africa, whether they be criminal trials, civil trials, appeals, whatever they may be, ought to be broadcast and streamed live. And that's the punchline of the case. The judge found that um, protection for the media in the right to freedom of expression and the constitutional principle of open justice. And he said that, um, Although it is about balancing, and this is not an absolute principle, that in every case there has to be streaming and broadcasting, you balance the rights by interrogating any objection by a party who makes an application to say, I don't want the trial televised, or I don't want my testimony televised, for whatever the reason is. And in Van Breda's case, the judge said, all he has come up with, with, with is speculative reasons as to why his trial rights would be harmed if he gives evidence in public. He said that he's a stutterer and he won't be able to give evidence if he's under the, the spotlight because of nerves. The judge said, we'll deal with that as it happens on an ad hoc basis, but that's not enough to displace the fundamental presumption which the court held applies that, the, uh, that court cases have to be broadcast live. And the court said, all these other concerns have to give way to this general <laughs> principle. So the judge, as I say, in this master's thesis, as I call it, went around the law in 10 countries, um, looked at the law in the United States, Canada, England and Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Austri Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Israel, Brazil, and also looked at the principles in four international and regional courts and, and how they uh, dealt with televising their proceedings. And also relied heavily, the judge and the Supreme Court of Appeal, on the work of our very own Professor Q Yum, who's in the audience, um, who, who gets a significant shout out by the court, and quite rightly so, for his work on cameras in the courtroom in, in America. And what's astonishing after the survey is the judge says, apart from the United States, all these jurisdictions do not permit televising trials. They permit, to some extent, experiments, uh, experimental televising. They permit televising appeals, but they don't televise trials. But as a result of the South African constitution and the confluence of open justice and freedom of expression, the court says, we believe this, it's time to recognize this fundamental principle um, of televising court proceedings. Um, there was an appeal to the constitutional court, which is our final court of appeal in November last year. That was rejected by the Constitutional Court without calling a hearing. They thought that it didn't raise any prospects of success. And what that means is that the Van Breda case is now the final word in South African law on the right to televise and stream court proceedings. Um, and I thought it would be interesting, that's uh, some still photographs from the case where Mr. Van Breda was asked to demonstrate what the intruder who he alleged um, had come upon his family was doing, um, and there's a video as well of some uh, of the testimony. One before the court, the acts. As far as you can remember and what you observed that night, in what manner did the attacker execute the attack on your brother? Can you please demonstrate to the court? As far as I could see, when the lights switched on, the attacker was facing. Um, looks like we're standing in between our two beds um, with Rudy lying on his bed here 
um, in the situation with the, if the attack is facing this way, I'm behind him. And um, he was swinging the axe down. Firstly, to get your posture and your positions correctly, sir, um, do I, is that how you intend to demonstrate that if the, if the bed is standing across in front of you, or from left to right, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at directions, from left to right in front of you, he's standing almost at an angle to the bed, or was he facing the bed directly? At an angle. At an angle. And the type of motion that he used? So it is a swinging motion from above your head, but not in swinging down across from you, but more if somewhat to the side. Correct. Do you agree? Not that that's, not that that's a representation of every movement he made, but that was... Um... Um, and I noticed very little stuttering going on, which was the reason he objected to the televising of the court case. So just bringing it all together in summary, what this case says is that as a default position, not as an absolute rule, but as a default position, uh, broadcasting court cases is now the general rule in South Africa. Um, it's not the exception. The media has a constitutional right to broadcast in their entirety on all platforms. I mean, all they need to do is advise the court hearing the case within 24 hours of the proceeding occurring that they'll be there with the cameras. It's then up to anyone who wants to object to raise a motivated objection that shows that the broadcast presents, and here's the test, a real risk of demonstrable prejudice. So it's not speculative harm. And mere speculation that there, be, that there will be prejudice will not suffice. Um, the court also said, even if you object to the broadcasting and streaming of your evidence, less restrictive alternatives will be looked at, such as, an example, audio only and not video, or in some cases, delayed broadcasts. But, and, and the point the court makes repeatedly, it's about trying to reconcile, as opposed to um, balancing in the strict sense, the right to a fair trial with the right to open justice, but the, the important presumption is now completely reversed, whereas the presumption before the case yes. was that you had no right to broadcast, to be there with your cameras. After the case, it's the reverse, and I would suggest it's uh, effected a fundamental change on um, South, Africa's, South African law, and hopefully a case that will be persuasive yes. in other jurisdictions. Right. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Dario. So here to address yet another major, major case, in fact, this was a case heard around the world, uh, Karuna will talk about the landmark privacy case in India. When this case was being argued, and uh, a nine-judge bench is a rare bird in any jurisdiction, but um, particularly in India, I, I was thinking about why I cared about it and why I felt strongly about it. And it came to me that if eyes are always upon me, the whole world is a prison. This is a truth that is intuitive, but um, I will now talk about three things. Why it took until 2017 for the Indian Supreme Court to find that, there was a, that Indians have a right to privacy, I'm going to talk a little, about, about, a little bit about the judgment itself, <clears throat> about the doctrinal importance of this judgment and why it's important in the world today as we grapple with um, not just personal and spatial privacy but also informational self-determination. And then I'm going to talk about the future cases that arise from it because remember that this is a broad constitutional right that was laid down. And um, the contours of it, many of the contours of it, are yet to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> now, towards the end of August, a uh, nine-judge bench of our Supreme Court unanimously held that the right to privacy is a fundamental right under the Indian Constitution. Um, it's not explicitly articulated as a right in our Constitution, unlike 
um, unlike, say, the Fourth Amendment, um, on which a large number of judgments are based that you wouldn't necessarily think would um, emerge from the right to privacy, right? Like Roe versus Wade, for example, the right to abortion. Um, essentially, what happened um, was that during arguments against the universal ID program that is being hotly contested now as we speak in our Supreme Court, um, the Attorney General of India said that the government's view was that <clears throat> Indians do not have a fundamental right to privacy. Now this was something that surprised some of us because there, are, there, was, a six, a, there was a six judge bench and an eight judge bench, both of which were perhaps not as clear as one would wish. And, but there was a whole line of judgments after that that did find a fundamental right to privacy, right? Um, but the Attorney General said that doubt was cast on the six judge bench and eight judge bench, thereby necessitating a nine judge bench to be set up. Um, as has been happening in a large number of cases, the Attorney General and the government has been bumping off a lot of controversial cases to larger benches, and we thought it would be years before it was decided. But the Supreme Court came together fairly fast, and unanimously, in six separate opinions, which dealt with a number of issues, ranging from data protection to state surveillance to um, abortion and bodily integrity, the Supreme Court decided that we do, in fact, have a right to privacy. Now, <clears throat> they laid down a number of broad doctrines. And those doctrines were, as I see it, the doctrines of bodily integrity, mental privacy, decisional autonomy, and informational self-determination. Now, the reason I think that um, this is important will become clear as we go through some of the salient parts of the separate opinions. And um, so, for example, one of the judges, Justice Chalameshwar, grounded his opinion in the concept of liberty, not just information, not just the right to receive information, but in the concept of liberty. He defined privacy as composing of three aspects, repose, sanctuary, and intimate decision. And he held that each of these aspects were central to liberty. Justice Nariman, <coughs> who I spoke about a few years ago, thank you, who I spoke about a few years ago um, uh, in our sort of big decision on online free speech, um, he linked the three aspects of privacy to bodily integrity, informational privacy, and the privacy of choice. He also linked it, interestingly, and very importantly, I think, with the preamble of the Constitution. Now, the preamble talks about democracy, right? And it talks about dignity, and it talks about fraternity. Um, and it was here, he said, that the constitutional foundations of privacy could be found. And he said, the dignity of the individual encompasses the right of the individual to develop to the full extent of his potential. And this development can only be if an individual has autonomy over fundamental personal choices and control over dissemination of personal information which may be infringed through an unauthorized use of such information. Justice Chandrachur, who sort of who spoke for the plurality of judges, not the majority, but the plurality. Um, in his judgment, he grounded privacy in dignity. And he brought it all together, I think, in a sense. Inviolate personality, he said, is the core of liberty and freedom. Autonomy, liberty, and bodily uh, and mental integrity. He said the freedoms under Article 19, which is our right to free speech, right to free expression, can be fulfilled where the individual is entitled to decide upon his or her preferences, read in conjunction with Article 21. Liberty enables the individual to have a choice of preferences on various facets of life, including what and how one will eat. It sounds like an academic question, but it's not in India, because at the moment, we have huge disputes around whether beef consumption is criminal or not. And a number of states have declared that it is, in fact, criminal. Um, and now, you know, the trouble is, of course, is that if the government does not 
see it as incumbent on themselves to act constitutionally on a continual basis, then the onus is not just on the courts, but on civil society to bring those cases in the first place, right? So you have government, which is huge, and government, say, decides to um, say, for example, that e the eating of beef is, or beef consumption is criminal. In some cases, the death penalty was being debated on whether um, people should be allowed to conserve. It's a, you know, some of you are looking puzzled. <laughs> the background to this, the background to this is that uh, the cow is a holy animal in Hinduism. And um, we, have a, we have a government that, um, that emerges from sort of strong Hindu roots and sees India as being a Hindu nation. And it's something that um, many of us um, strongly oppose. And so this is why the liberty to decide what one will eat is something that, um, is something that was uh, so fund fundamentally important. Um, the way one will dress, the faith one will espouse, as you can imagine, also under threat and a myriad other matters in which autonomy and self-determination require a choice to be made within the privacy of the mind. The constitutional right to the freedom of religion under Article 25 has implicit within it the ability to choose a faith and the freedom to express or not to express these choices to the world. Privacy represents, they went on to say, the core of the human personality and recognizes the ability of each individual to make choices and to take decisions governing matters intimate and personal. Now, there are those who object to the fact that this, is, that the, this particular judgment was not more concrete, was not more specific. For instance, they grounded the right in Article 21, which is the right to life, yes. But they also said that it, is, it emerges from our entire chapter of fundamental rights, right? So which means that what is the test then? How do you, how do you, you know, what is the test for whether something passes the litmus test of constitutionality or not? Um, <clears throat> one test that was laid out, it's more an Article 21 test, was that there must be a law, there must be a legitimate purpose, and it must be proportionate to the end that is sought to be achieved. But if you challenged that under Article 29, if you challenged an uh, executive decision or if you challenged a law under Article 19, I beg your pardon, uh, the test would be different. The test would be an Article 19 test, whether it is a reasonable restriction, whether it falls within the eight permissible heads to um, enact a law or um, you know, make a decision, and whether there is a law or not. Now, <clears throat> I think this is particularly important, right? Because when we speak of privacy, very often conceptions of privacy have been kind of thought of in particular kinds of silos, say bodily integrity, you know, Roe versus Wade. Um, marital privacy, sort of oddly in Griswold, which I disagree with on sort of feminist grounds. Um, which I will also come to. Um, informational privacy, the different silo. And here in this judgment, I think extremely eloquently and very, very cogently, they bring all of this together and ground it in the development of the full personality and dignity of a human being. Now, this is all very abstract and lovely. So you may ask, so what and who cares, right? <laughs> um, I am currently, not now, now, but the arguments are going on in court, um, arguing in uh, our high court, and we chose it because we wanted two bites of the cherry, um, that marital rape, the marital rape exception that does not criminalize a man who rapes his wife be struck down as unconstitutional. Now, we had sort of begun the case a while ago, and then this privacy judgment came. <laughs> and we are now founding a number of our claims on this judgment. Um, <clears throat>
For example, the judges here had the courage to cite Catherine McKinnon and um, the great dominance feminist and um, from Chicago. And they cited her feminist critique of privacy and they said that granting special status to privacy is detrimental to women and others because it is used as a shield to dominate and control them, um, silence them and cover up abuse. Inevitably, the, you know, the best version of the government's arguments, and believe me, if you just Google them and read them, they're just not even as clever as this. But however, um, we will argue it in court. <laughs> Um, the, what they are arguing is that they are saying that, look, the institution of marriage is inviolate. So they are arguing privacy as well, right? So they are saying that the institution of marriage is inviolate, and a man's home is his castle, which is a very sort of frequent articulation of the idea of privacy, which has visited all sorts of um, you, you know, brutality and harms. On, sorry, how much? Do I, do? Um, we're at twelve minutes. Oh, okay, I'll hurry up. <laughs> Which has visited all sorts of brutality and harm on the bodily integrity, the the privacy of the body of women, and happily in this case, the court did not shy away from addressing this point, for, uh, you know, full frontal, and they said that privacy must not be utilized as a cover to conceal and. Uh, um, assert patriarchal mindsets. The challenge in this area is to enable the state to take the violation of the dignity of women in the domestic sphere seriously, while at the same time protecting the privacy entitlements of women grounded in the identity of gender and liberty. Um, they also affirmed Jija Ghosh versus the Union of India, a case that I had argued, where the court has stated it's a disabled woman getting on a plane and they sort of took her off the plane because they said, um, because she was frothing at the mouth, it's you know, frequent in cerebral palsy doesn't mean that you're ill. Um, and, you know, we got sort of fairly large damages for her and changed the rules. And the court there stated that the duty of the state is to protect an individual's autonomous decisions to enable a life well lived. Life within the, within the meaning of Article 21 is not confined to the integrity of the physical body. We are also arguing <clears throat> Article 19, the right to sexual expression. Because if my right to say no is taken away, my right to say yes is a nullity. And this reduces me to a legal subject and a sexual object. Um, the foundation of this is also found to some extent in this judgment, where um, they affirmed the rights of transgenders and said, um, <coughs> and said that uh, gender identity and sort of what you wear and your behavior is protected under Article 19. Now, very, very briefly, <laughs> um, we will see what happens in the national ID case um, where it is mandatory to sort of give your biometrics to the government to keep in a centralized database. There are lots of false positives and lots of false negatives. The poorest people sometimes are left out. Many are starving as a result. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently actually writing something for the Financial Times on Monday um, because of the Windrush scandal. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. Because people who had, in that case, you know, in that situation, people who did not have IDs are being discriminated against and are being left out. And um, Bertrand and I, here's your due credit, Bertrand, yeah. <laughs> were discussing this um, yesterday. And you know, the thing is that when you sort of take positions in law, when you take positions, I think, on rights, particularly around constitutional law, then it you know, tends to come from a very visceral place. And I think like in engaging with this issue, um, it's become even more clear to me. I think it's, it's always somewhat clear to us as litigators because you have to put the most <laughs> yes, reasonable option exactly. before the judge because you do a balancing, the best balancing that you can yourself. That <clears throat> looking at all sides of it is just, you know, really important because in India, people are sort of, you know, completely against this national idea at the moment, right? And um, 
In the UK, in 2009, the law was proposed, it was then repealed, and now it's being reconsidered. So I think you need to sort of think about all sides. We also saw that in sort of talking about intermediary liability okay. yesterday. <clears throat> Wrapping up very yeah. quickly. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, I think this is going to have massive implications across the board, and I think yes. it's really worth looking at um, for various different jurisdictions. And thank you, Agnes, for having me, and thank you, Holly, and everyone who organized this, because yes. this is always a wonderful place to take a step back, yes. reflect on our own practice, yes. and to learn and be enriched by the practice and ideas of others. Yes, thank very you. good. Thank you so much, Karina. I appreciate it. And definitely look forward to more discussions uh, later on um, when we're having our discussion section, of course, during lunch. So, Taz, you're going to be talking about Brazil and this very interesting censorship case um, that rose, um, that um, had some uh, interesting issues on which the decision was based. Yes. Thank you, Columbia uh, University and Agnes for inviting us and all the work that Holly and Ba had to bring all of us here. Thank you. The case I will bring you today is a clear example how freedom of expression can be hurt by intimidation in Brazil. I represented uh, Folha de São Paulo, one of the biggest newspapers, um, in a lawsuit filed by Brazilian First Lady, who was trying to stop a story from being published. In February 2017, freedom of expression was attacked by the First Lady of Brazil, Marcela Temer, and by a judge sitting in Brasilia. As a result, two of the biggest uh, national dailies, O Globo and Folha de São Paulo, were ordered to remove a piece of news from their websites and prohibited from printing it in their per paper version. The Federal Court, Court of Appeals eventually suspended the censorship and the report was finally published. Nonetheless, the facts deserve our full attention. So I think... Um what do I have to... to No slides. Okay, I can continue. I no. <laughs> okay, so as I was. Do you think? There we go. Oh, okay. Okay. In 2016, a hacker attempted to extort the First Lady after breaking into her cell phone. The hacker had access to the First Lady's personal files, including photographs and some messages she had exchanged with her brother. The hacker demanded $90,000 not to disclose the material and was sentenced into prison for attempted extortion. Months later, Folha de São Paulo had access to the files of the criminal proceedings in which the hacker was found guilty and posted on its website a news article with the headline, Hacker Threatened to Drag President Temer's Reputation Through the Mood. As if our president needed any help for that. <laughs> <laughs> President, uh, our president uh, has a very low approval rating. Uh, among the population, he has only 7% of uh, approval, so it's very uh, difficult. Yes. The newspapers reported that the hacker would have promised to blemish the president's name for its alleged involvement in illegal acts. On the same day the news article was posted online, the First Lady filed a suit to remove it from the internet and avoid it from being published in print, which was to occur the next day. The trial court judge granted the censorship under the argument that the president's wife's intimacy was to be protected, 
and the disclosure of the information could cause serious harm. So that's the, the news about the censorship. And we had also Intercept also noticed here in United States in he, its website. Both newspapers, Folha de São Paulo and O Globo, appealed to the Federal Court of Appeals, alleging that the information reported was obtained from public case files, which could even be accessed on the internet. From some years now, uh, Brazil has adopted electronic court files, so they can be accessed. Now, they are not very uh, easy to be accessed. We have to make a, a lot of research to, in order to access it, and the newspaper made it easier. So that's the problem that the First Lady was arguing, that it was so easy. I was personally working in this case at that time, and because of the way things work in Brazil, we even decided to validate the fact that the, those documents had already been in the internet. We were afraid that a president order could remove them from the internet, and so we won't be able to prove that they were already public. Both dailies claimed that the First Lady's message exchange was not a private matter, but much to the contrary, because it was evidently in the public interest, the subject deserved broad publicity. And considering that the Brazilian Supreme Court has been ruling against censorship on the press, this decision was bound to be reversed. In fact, two days later, the Federal Court of Appeals reversed the decision. In his vote, the justice asserted that the appealed decision was unconstitutional because it violated a fundamental freedom, which is a pillar for the democratic state of law. The justice also said that he could not consent to the idea that the judiciary could establish in advance what should or should not be published in the press. And he explained that there was nothing indicating that such newspapers, editorial lines, would, were irresponsible or abusive. The decision is crucial for Brazilian courts because it creates a precedent uh, for the protection of freedom of the press. If, on the one hand, this event reveals the president's attempt to weaken freedom of expression. On the other hand, it shows that Brazilian courts are ready to protect and highlight the constitutional principles of freedom of the press and information. The courts had also reinforced the idea that it's up to the newspapers to decide which information they will disclose or publish and when and how they are going to do it. And that such assumptions not only serve to guarantee freedom of expression, but also reinforce credibility and impartiality of the press. Should newspapers be prevented from publishing a news article, the entire framework of freedoms would be undermined. That's um, my, the case I brought to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Taz, so much for donating your extra three minutes to our next speaker. <laughs> so ISEF is going to talk about uh, a case involving a LGBTQ um, NGO and whether or not it has a right uh, to have access to web radio. Thank you, Doreen. So, as Doreen mentioned, I will uh, share with you a recent decision uh, dealing from Tunisia courts, dealing with uh, the right of uh, LGBT NGOs, uh, their right to uh, a web community radio in Tunisia. And of course, the internet of Tunisia uh, is, uh, is managed by, by, by a national and a public uh, institute, which is the Tunisian Agency of Internet, and it's the exclusive uh, furniture. Uh, so uh, maybe the question seems to be a little bit stacking or uh, shocking in uh, a country like uh, Tunisia, which is belonging to 
the Arab uh, region. Uh, Tunisia, of course, uh, is belong to this region, and uh, I think in this region, uh, the question, the issue of uh, LGBT rights, it's a crucial uh, question, uh, and the, the sodomy is criminalized in all uh, the region, all the country of the region, including Tunisia. So this is what maybe make this decision a little bit uh, uh, strange. So, and before uh, I will, in 10 minutes, <laughs> before, uh, before presenting the, uh, the, uh, the complaint and the position of the judiciary, I would like just to brief you on the legal framework of the Tunisian legal framework that is governing the judges in Tunisia and uh, the legal framework that uh, the uh, Tunisian judges is, uh, should uh, respect while uh, uh, dealing with uh, such issue. So Tunisia is a party uh, to all international human rights uh, treaties that contain provision for the protection of the freedom of the human rights freedom. Uh, there is only one convention that Tunisia didn't ratify yet, uh, which is the uh, convention on uh, uh, the right of migrant workers uh, and some uh, uh, and, uh, of the migrant workers. Uh, uh, Tunisia, uh, uh, of course, is now living a continuous transitional uh, uh, democratic transition uh, since 2011. Uh, it adopted its uh, constitution in 2014 and the constitution uh, is seen by the Tunisian uh, as a very progressive, progress, progressive settlement both in the country-owned context, but also in the Arab region. Uh, many of Tunisian, uh, and this is the context also, and uh, the, uh, to when, when I say Tunisian, I say also judges, Tunisian judges. Many of Tunisians see this constitution as a compromise among diverse interests, especially between objectives to extend greater influence for the Islam, the, the, uh, which is the official religion of uh, the Republic. Uh, 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 there is uh, this objective to extend greater influence for Islam in public affairs. And also on the other side, there is objectives to secure secular influence. Uh, thus, while the Article 1 of the Constitution establishes Islam as the religion of Tunisia, the Article 2 of the same Constitution declares that Tunisia is a civil state based on citizenship di dictated by the will of the people and the supremacy of the law. Uh, the Constitution enshrined a clear commitment to the civil state characterized by a national identity that is defined by several elements. And we will see together that they are sometimes they can be contradictory. So the several elements who are uh, identifying uh, Tunisia, they include Islam, the country's Arab heritage, and also the universal human rights. And I am quoting what is enshrined in the preamble of the Constitution. The Article uh, 6 of the Constitution guarantees freedom of conscience, belief, and the free exercise of religious practices for all Tunisian uh, and other uh, Constitution provision reinforce these guarantees through a commitment to fundamental human rights, especially those related to freedom of religion, association, peaceful assembly, uh, guarantees also for equality before the law and the principle of proportionality required for the establishment of limitation of this right. Uh, so, uh, and this is in the Constitution. But there is more recent development at the legal, uh, uh, at the legal uh, step, at the legal level, sorry, that uh, illustrate the Tunisia's strong commitment to equality uh, uh, and freedom uh, and human rights freedom. This includes, includes the recent uh, withdrawal of all substantive reservation to the UN CEDAW in April 2015, in addition to the announcement of the government decision to uh, rescind a circular 
to drop or to drop or to left a circular dated uh, 73 that imposed a ban on marriage between Tunisian Muslims women and non-Muslims men uh, uh, and that was in September, the left has been made in September 2017. Uh, uh, also, there is a commission uh, established recently by the President of the Republic, uh, tasked with reporting uh, on uh, the, the, le the legal framework that is not in line with the Constitution. So, that, and this report will deal with the issue of LGBTs, with the, it will make an assessment of the penal code and other, uh, other legal instrument. And uh, the report will suggest the, uh, the relevant uh, amendment uh, for this legal framework so that the, the current legal framework would be uh, match, sorry, the international standard and the, uh, and the constitutional standards. So this is, uh, uh, this is a global uh, context. Uh, as I mean, as the most important uh, point here is to mention that there is a constitution which is uh, uh, guarantee the human rights standard, uh, human rights uh, for all the citizens, and there is some legal framework dated uh, from, uh, like the penal code, which is dated from 1940 and it is still in force and should be amended to match the, the constitution standards. Uh, so uh, this is the legal framework. Uh, the other point, is, which is very important also, that the sodomy or any, uh, the sodomy is criminalized in Tunisia. It's clearly the article 2000, uh, 230 in the penal code uh, make the sodomy or the homosexuality relation as a crime punishable up, up to three uh, years in jail. Uh, more than this, we have uh, in, the, in the same penal code, the same penal code, it's uh, mentioned that uh, Uh, the, fa uh, the fact, so, so since the homosexuality is criminalized by law, the fact of expression, support, or promoting any homosexuality or LGBT rights could be considered as a gross indecency behavior according to another article from the penal code, which is the two, uh, 206. Uh, 26, uh, So for the current decision that I will share with you, I would like to start by this ambivalence in the mind of the Tunisian judges. So we have here the law. This is uh, the law in Arabic. You find here the Republic of Tunisia prize to Allah. And then down you find a uh, uh, judiciary decision, decision in the name of the Tunisian people. And now I will share with you uh, the facts of these uh, issues. So it was simple. In, uh, in Tunisia, we have uh, an LGBTs. We have three or four LGBTs or NGOs who are working in line also, who are uh, working uh, in perfect conformity with uh, the, uh, the Tunisian law on uh, right to association, which is a decree law uh, uh, issued after the revolution. So we have around four uh, NGOs. One of them is Shams NGOs. It names it Shams. Uh, so it is an LGBT, uh, an LGBT uh, NGO working on, promo on uh, uh, promoting the rights of LGBT communities. Uh, uh, and all the sexual, so all the sexual minorities. Uh, so, uh, the, for the fact, these NGOs uh, in December 2017 lynched its exercises, exercised its right as a national NGOs to have its community web radio because the law 
on the audiovisual in Tunisia, it recognized three kinds of, uh, of, of media, the public media, the private media, and the community media. That me, and this is new. This uh, has been achieved after the, the revolution. That means any NGO in Tunisia has the right now to raise its voice through a community radio, web radio, of course, but also FM radio, uh, and it should apply for a visa from the independent regulatory body in Tunisia tasked with regulating the audiovisual uh, uh, sectors. So the, uh, the association, they launched their, in December, they launched their uh, web radio, and uh, the launch was in 15 of December. In 18 of December, the complaint has been submitted to the court three days after. By, by whom? by uh, what we, uh, let me translate, by the National Union Council of Imams and Moscow's staff members. This is also a national uh, NGO, which is working uh, in line with, uh, we are always, we are, we continue to be in the ambiguity, which we are wor working in line with the, uh, the national uh, law on association. So the, uh, the, the, the Council of Imams submitted the complaint uh, to the court asking, asking to, uh, to issue an urgent preliminary injunction to, uh, to suspend, to close the site, the website of the radio. They were based on, so I am quoting the petition, argued that the radio station called Chems is fine, first is financed from outside of the country because the financial was uh, at that time was by the uh, uh, Netherlands embassy. And that was clear and in line with also the legal framework in Tunisia. Secondly, they argued that uh, that sodomy and lesbian are criminalized under the law. Third, that the family as the first structure in, the, in, in society could be protected only if, I'm quoting what, they, what, uh, the, what is uh, in the petition, only if the horns that call for it to be dismantled are silenced. Three, they, uh, uh, the Shams Radio, which is the voice of Shams Association, broadcasts programs that breach, breach, or breach the public order and the penal code, especially the Article 230. Uh, and four, and for their four argument is no one carrying out prohibited or criminal activities could enjoy a voice in the form of a radio station and allow a line online public access to information about these activities. These were the argument of the, uh, the, uh, the council. Uh, for the defendant, yes. the lawyer, he, uh, he said that uh, the, the council has now the legal quality to sue, the, uh, to, uh, to lodge the complaint since, uh, since it is uh, 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 a section of the whole labor trade union and only the whole, the, the, uh, the central labor trade union should uh, lodge the complaint. And then the court, okay. uh, and then the court, I would like, uh, the court rejected the petition based on, I will quote the court, uh, based on the absence of the legal quality of the Council of Imam to, to lodge this complaint. Uh, uh, but the court does not stop here, mm -hmm. and this is very important for this decision. Even this decision doesn't touch the heart of the... Uh, if, uh, mm -hmm. It's not the de um, uh, discussion, the, the right of... Uh, the fundamental right. Uh, they, they give uh, they they give the, an opinion. We can find here an opinion. So the so the court said, uh, 
it is clear that the professional unions shall have the capacity to litigate if the goal, only if the goal is to avert any direct or indirect prejudice that may affect the profession represented by them, only for this target. And uh, the court said, whereas, beside the fact that the climate did not submit its statutes so that the goals it defends by means of its union activities be understood, the documents enclosed uh, with the petition fail to provide any indication of any breaches, breaches of abuse committed by the, by, uh, the association that caused prejudice to the, the trade or uh, union activity, activity represented. The court should stop here and reject the projects in but the court, go further and he say, whereas in addition to this, the mere, whereas the mere fact of creating a radio action by the second defendant, that means the association, and regardless of the people who run the station, does not prejudice whether, whether directly or indirectly the professional activities overseen by the climate. Furthermore, the climate failed to submit any proof that the second defendant, through the content of its programs, breached any of this rule or respect for other and their reputation, which would also breach, breach the general guidelines stipulated in the decree law 116 related to freedom of your okay. Just okay. to yeah. close, yes. that the role that the court ignore the argument based yes. on the art criminalization of right. the, uh, the sodomy, yeah. and they bring the discussion to the freedom of uh, the audiovisual and the freedom of expression. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, which is an interesting point um, that uh, ISAS raises, which is, um, and we will see repeatedly through some of these decisions, is where the courts are making the decision that there is a right, uh, is there a right to communications as part of freedom of expression? And so um, uh, Umar is going to talk about his case in Pakistan that deals with uh, the rights of having access to mobile networks. Hello and assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, very grateful to Dr. Calamard for inviting me. Um, I'd just like to give you a background of the case that I participated in in Islamabad, which I'm going to speak about. Uh, the background of this case is that Pakistan has a robust telecommunications system where there are more than 70 million people who use mobile telecommunication services. And um, the mobile phone has really made phone accessible to people in areas and in segments of society who never could afford a landline. So mobile, access to mobile uh, phones is not just a, um, it's not just a theoretical issue, it is an issue which affects uh, more than 70 million people directly and it also has an angle of uh, class and economics to it. Um, because people who are in some ways the most vulnerable or the most underprivileged depend upon their mobile phones more than people who are not so, uh, who are more privileged. So in that context, um, we filed a petition uh, challenging mobile shutdowns in Pakistan. And um, I'm just getting a hang of how this works. Okay. Anyways, that's uh, just a. Yeah. Yes, it, that was only meant to be a. Um, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. So we go yep. on the, yep. the arrow. Okay. Okay, so the petition was filed in 2016, and I represented four petitioners, Masuma Hassan, uh, Muhammad Zuhaib, Ahmed Raza, and Wakar Ahmed. I thought I should acknowledge them, because as lawyers, we never get a chance to do those fancy theatrics in courts, unless there are people who are you know, brave enough, bothered enough, or careless enough to give us a public interest petition. 
So um, you'll notice that this is a motley group of citizens. And the only thing that they really share is that they use a phone, they <laughs> care about it, right. and they are in some way in my network. So they would be duped into filing a petition. Um, actually, that's an exaggeration. I think uh, I also got duped into filing the petition on their behalf. Um, so with these four public interest petitioners, we went to court and we filed a petition challenging the legality of the government's ability to shut down mobile phones. Um, this is, um, mobile phone shutdown is something that many of you may never have experienced in your lives. Uh, our friends from India, I think, certainly have some experience of what that means. It basically means that one day you wake up and your phone is not working. And in addition to the fact that it's not working, uh, generally, at least in Pakistan, you also don't know exactly how long that's going to be. So it could be two hours or it could be two weeks. Uh, so you can't plan accordingly. So we had a mobile shutdown in Islamabad. We've had it regularly. But this time around, in 2016, we decided to challenge it. And one of the things that I found really helpful was a, so, so, so basically, we, we had a shutdown. And we were all very angry. And we thought, let's do something about it. And then we Googled, of course. The internet was thankfully working. And we found a report sponsored by some donor, conducted by a Pakistani NGO, Bites for All, which is dedicated to um, digital rights. And their research made it very clear to me uh, that there is actually a statutory provision in Pakistani law, which, if we argue it well enough, should mean that network disconnections are illegal. So based upon that research, we went to court. The case went on for about two, uh, two years. In the, uh, you know, during the proceedings of our case, um, about two weeks after we filed and it became national news, one of the telecom companies also joined hands with us. Um, and uh, this is why when you read the judgment, you'll find mention of both of us. Um, so a group of citizens and a very powerful telecom company together, we contested this case for about two years. The government also tried to come up with arguments. The most prominent argument um, was that, look, we're not shutting down phones because we like to. We have to do it because we have to do it for national security. And as uh, you know, the guest speaker yesterday told you national security is one of those uh, claims that uh, is very hard to get around. But of course, you have to find ways. So the government had no evidence to show that shutting down mobile phones makes the world any more safe. In fact, um, to the contrary, the research that many researchers have done, which we presented to the court, um, shows that Shutting down mobile phones actually reduces your chances of effectively tackling an emergency situation or a security risk. Um, but after that two-year contest in February 2018, we, uh, we won. And the Islamabad High Court declared that network shutdowns are illegal, and the government can no longer do it. Um, for about three weeks, we had, the, you know, we had the glorious era of network shutdowns being illegal all over Pakistan. But then the government went in appeal against us, and the appeal is still pending. Um, so that's the overall uh, you know, story of the case. Um, I wanted to share with you the, uh, an excerpt of our um, prayer. Um, so is it the one that goes forward? OK. So in a little while, I think you will <laughs> we, we will get around to this. But essentially, there's, there's, there, that's only a prop. You see, the real yeah. thing that you need to concentrate upon is, is me right now. Right. <laughs> so, so there were three main arguments that we were making. One, we said this is contrary to a specific provision in Pakistan's telecommunications law. That provision I will read out in detail. But it essentially says that the government has the power to suspend mobile phone services subject to a proclamation of emergency. 
The term proclamation of emergency is not defined in the telecom statute, but it is a well-known uh, term of art uh, which is mentioned in the Constitution. And uh, what it means is that the government in extremely rare and un, you know, controllable circumstances can uh, uh, suspend the enforcement of fundamental rights by the high courts. And this has been done only once or twice in, twice in Pakistan's 70 years of history. So it's a, an extremely high threshold that has to be met before this power can be exercised. In effect, it means that it can't be done. So we argued that the network suspensions are illegal because they are contrary to this specific provision of the statute. <coughs> uh, but the broader argument we made, and that is our second, was that we have a fundamental right of access to telecommunication. Now, the Pakistani constitution mentions, enumerates a number of around 15 different, um, more than that actually, uh, fundamental rights. Uh, the access to telecommunication is definitely not mentioned there explicitly, uh, but everywhere in the common law world, we have a tradition of expansively interpreting provisions, and the Pakistani Supreme Court has historically expanded the scope of the right to life and the right to dignity and so on and so forth. So we called upon the court to accept the, uh, to, to, to read the Constitution as implying in a, a right of access to telecommunication. More specifically, the, the right, the freedom of movement. We argued that freedom of movement in the pre-telecom world meant my ability to go and meet somebody and then to do business with them, to speak to them, to exchange political ideas, to do all sorts of things. Um, most of those things we now do through uh, telecommunication. So I wouldn't, you know, I've only come, I, I have had to fly 7,000 miles to come and meet you, but I was only able to do it because uh, Dr. Calamard is, got in touch with me through Twitter. And, so if my freedom of movement, you see, is dependent upon and it is sort of inhe inherent in the right uh, of telecommunication. So anyways, that was the fancier, bigger argument we wanted to make. Um, that's the argument which actually, actually I imagined before I did my research. When I did my research, I found that there's actually a statutory provision, easier to do. And the third argument was a consumer rights argument. We looked at the consumer protection rules and we discovered that the consumer protection rules say, okay, fine, if there's any, under, under any circumstances, the telecom companies have to shut down my phone. They are obliged to give me notice they, about they're do, what they're doing, why they're doing it, how long they're gonna do it, and those things were not happening. So between these three arguments, we uh, were trying to argue, and the court eventually uh, accepted uh, only one of these arguments, which is that telecom shutdowns in Pakistan are contrary to Pakistani telecommunications law, and specifically Section 54. So, you know, we, I'm going to read out uh, certain portions of this. You're going to, now is the time to focus on the slide, not me. <laughs> so, so there is a specific provision which mentions national security. Thankfully, in 1996, when this law was written, somebody was um, you know, precocious enough to imagine that this is going to be needed. There are three provisions here. One which says that the government may authorize any person or persons to intercept. So that's an interception thing. Two is that the government shall have preference and priority in telecommunications system. Um, and the third provision, subsection three, is specifically can, the government, upon proclamation of emergency, can cause suspension of services. So the government's argument all along has been uh, that the right to have preference and priority means we can do anything. Uh, unfortunately, the term preference and priority has not been defined in this statute or in any Pakistani statute that we could find. But, 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 but the clear thing is that subsection three makes it very clear that the government can cause suspension and there is a certain condition that has to be met. So subsection three, you know, even if, and the court has addressed the argument that if, even if you, the government were to try and rely upon subsection two, which is a broad generic term, preference and priority, that would make subsection three redundant. 
So um, uh, the court has been pleased to accept our argument, and it has ruled that the power to suspend or cause suspension of the services, operations, or functions of a licensed telecommunication provider in the context of national security is exclusively provided under subsection 3 of, subsection, uh, of section 54, and that it can only be invoked if there is a proclamation of emergency. The fundamental rights argument and the consumer rights argument has not been addressed. So thankfully, it has not been dismissed. It's just that the, government, uh, the, the, that the court, and I, I can see the wisdom behind it, that if there is a clear statutory provision, why go into interpretation? Um, that, I think, brings me to, I had brought a picture of the judge who gave the judgment, because after all, you know, we are all part of the, we're, we're a t it's a teamwork. Uh, we shouldn't make it too obvious, as the speaker yesterday was saying, but it is a teamwork. Uh, we, you know, the quick takeaway is, firstly, you know, without that right. research report which somebody wrote who had no clue of ever going to court, right. we couldn't have done it. So research feeds into advocacy, that's one. That's Two, strategic litigation doesn't always fail, and it's not always counterproductive, right. because those things happen, but it also works. And the third point I want to make is, is that in certain situations, the interests of human rights and businesses are, uh, are um, aligned. Yes. And we should make use of that. Yes. Because if we didn't have China Mobile standing up, I think the judge would have felt a little nervous. I don't feel nervous. Uh, my wife who's here doesn't feel nervous. But I think the judge would have felt a little nervous ruling for petitioners you know, in the public interest of taking on national security. <laughs> And the last point is that um, I think with a little pushing, um, we often focus on fundamental rights and on areas of law which are totally open to judicial interpretation. But if we can pin down a specific statutory provision that's in our favor, that often works wonders in human rights work. So uh, with that, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to you for the audience. And uh, I look forward to the questions. Very good. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then our final speaker, Richard, will be talking about a case from the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to Agnes. Thank you to Columbia. Thank you to all the organizers for, for having me here. I was going to start by saying, as I look out over you, I realize I'm at a disadvantage. But I don't have to say that. As I close my eyes and smell out over you, I realize I'm at a disadvantage. Because I am the man who is standing between you and your lunch, um, which I can see at the back, and the rest of you can't. So I will try and keep this as brief as possible. Um, I, and also, I'd like to uh, uh, pay tribute to the, the, uh, the very impressive bench of, of esteemed jurists I'm sitting with. I feel humbled to be sitting at the end as a tail end Charlie, um, coming up more in my capacity as a journalist than a lawyer. Um, but that is what it informs, and I'm hoping the clicker is now going to work. It did work. That is what informs the, the, the case I've chosen from the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and the thing which underpins my, uh, my speech is this old bromide which I teach all my journalist students, the first thing I teach them, is that news is what someone somewhere doesn't want you to know. Everything else is advertising. Um, and this is kind of an important thing, and it's one of the things which I'm going to explain engages this case and engaging this element of the expanding Article 10 right to freedom of expression. Bear with me and I'll explain how at the end. But it also involves, it's hyper flippy, it also involves this case. And um, this is actually the case I would like to discuss. Uh, the reason I can't is it hasn't actually reached the European Court of Human Rights yet, uh, nor is it likely to for about three or four years. But I'm pretty sure it will. Uh, this is a case in relation to the Paradise Papers data dump. Uh, this was a, journal, a bit of journalism for all those who don't know. Uh, which involved um, uh, a dump of some uh, uh, large amount of uh, uh, legally professionally privileged material from the uh, uh, law, law firm Appleby, uh, which was dealt with by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists and the BBC and The Guardian published it. It's the subject of litigation at the moment in the UK, 
Um, and Appleby are arguing, um, amongst other things, that the news organisations have breached uh, the UK law of confidence in doing so. Now, the reason why this is relevant is because the Article 10 case under discuss is directly, um, directly relates to any future appeal this case may have to the European Court. It beca it's because it deals with the extent to which Article 10 deals with news gathering, speech before speech, the actions which go into activities before someone actually utters words, the actions which go before communication. Um, I put up briefly uh, Article 10. I don't think I need to take anyone through it. I'm sure we can all recite it, uh, uh, but I put it up there for form's sake. So I'll whiz through that quickly. He says, trying to be a bit more light-fingered on the clicker. Um, before I get to the case itself, though, I thought I'd give you a little, uh, uh, little brief uh, discover, uh, description of what happened in Europe over the past calendar year. And I had a look at the HUDOC uh, database, which those who don't know is the database of ECHR decisions, and I did a little bit of trawling on it. It looks like there were 55 Article 10 related cases over the past year. Um, I think this list is incomplete. Uh, I double cross-checked with the, um, the rather splendid um, Columbia University Global Freedom of Expression database, and I found some cases on there which weren't on the HUDOC website, so I commend Columbia University's website to you. So I think it's incomplete, but it's not a bad uh, indication of the sort of scale. Um, the uh, ECHR usefully categorizes its cases into uh, importance, and the five most important cases I've put up there that it classifies, they call them case reports. The two top ones are expedited appeals for Turkish journalists who've been prosecuted. The second one is an interesting case, Becker in Norway, an interesting case about journalistic source protection, rather interestingly, because it uh, cites uh, UN soft law in it, uh, which is a, a quite an interesting uh, development. The third one is um, the latest round in the internal battle between freedom of expression and data protection in Europe. Um, and that SATA media case has been bubbling away for a long while. Uh, fascinating case, and I'll refer to it a little bit in the end. The fourth one is a, is a, is a really quite curious case about um, a private letter which made defamatory allegations. Um, uh, and the, to be honest, I think the Grand Chamber made up a bit of a mess in its decision on it. There's a very good analysis on the Strasbourg Observer's website of why, uh, and I might refer you to that if you want to know more. Uh, and the last one is, um, uh, is a case about uh, the rights of homosexuals to uh, uh, promote, uh, uh, promote their life choice, which was constrained by Russia, uh, and it was appealed up to the uh, Grand Chamber, uh, Third Chamber, sorry. All very important cases, but none of the ones I'm going to discuss. Um, the, uh, uh, this is a description of uh, how those ones were classified. The case I'm going to talk about there is uh, but Kavich against Russia, and I apologize for Russian speakers for mauling uh, the language. Uh, I apologize, I am Anglophone with all that entails, all the downsides. Um, the reason it's interesting um, is because, for those who don't know, there is arguably a carve out in Article 10 for journalism um, in some way. I'm being slightly tentative there because I already had an argument with Jonathan earlier on and I see Tarlac looking at me beadily um, about the extent to which this is a viable proposal. Uh, but it's in the literature, and I think it is reasonably viable to suggest that Article 10 is treated, uh, when it's related to journalists, uh, in a different way by the European Court uh, than um, when it's treated to, uh, in relation to other people. The, the, the European Court emphasizes the watchdog nature of uh, journalists in society, and as a result, treats it slightly differently. So let's assume that that's correct for the moment. Two questions, amongst others, arise. So what does it mean? Who does it extend to? Who does it protect? And what does it protect? And these are the questions which I think this case actually addresses. What are the facts? The facts are rather humdrum. Um, it relates to uh, a, a um, anti-G8 protest in Russia in 2006. That takes us back to when Russia was in the G8, um, uh, 2006. And a Ukrainian television journalist um, was on leave. So he wasn't, he wasn't actually working for his uh, institution. Uh, he was doing some work for small local media organizations, non-institutional journalist organizations. And uh, on his account, he was walking down the road and he saw a uh, protest. And like any good journalist, he started taking pictures and noting and finding out what was going on. 
Some police officers told him to stop on his account, he did. He proved to them he was a journalist by showing his press card. On their account, he didn't, and he argued with them, so they arrested him. Uh, they took him to the station, and they put him in preventative um, pre-trial detention. Uh, subsequently, they tried him and convicted him. He appealed, uh, well, he got three days. He appealed, and they got it reduced to two. Um, so those are the facts, rather humdum. Uh, and he appealed up to the, well, he, he, he took the case to the European Court of Human Rights, which is where we come in. Um, now, I've been asked to take you through the uh, logic, the judicial reasoning of the European Court of Human Rights. For any of you, and there are many in this room, who have read the judicial reasoning of the European Court of Human Rights, it is frequently, how can I say that, uh, not as pellucid and as well-reasoned as some apex courts in the world, and I do apologise if there are any judges in the room. Uh, in theory, what is on the screen is the, uh, the process uh, which the court should apply to Article 10 cases. Um, in fact, what is on the screen is the two bits of the test they applied in this particular case. Um, uh, to, to sum up their reasoning, what they said is in relation to the uh, pre-trial detention, um, this, the European Court said, um, was not prescribed by law, and they based this finding on the fact that the actual arrest was a breach of Article 6 because um, it wasn't connected uh, and grounded in the legal instrument which permitted an arrest in those circumstances. In terms of the, uh, uh, the, the subsequent events, so the, the trial and the subsequent detention, um, a similar sort of argument, the European Court said the Russians didn't give either in the court processes or at any stage relevant and sufficient reasons for the interference with uh, the uh, freedom of expression that was involved. So therefore they struck it down on both those limbs and Mr. Buskevich got a, a resounding success. But the, uh, the rationale, the, the, the reasoning itself is not, as I indicated at the beginning, why I've chosen this case. It's two things. There are two of, these, two of the questions which struck me as interesting which came out of it. To whom does the art, journalistic Article 10, if I can call it that, apply? Does it apply to functional or institutional journalists? Now, the case answered this because, on the facts, um, the applicant was not acting as an institutional journalist. He wasn't acting for the Ukrainian television station who worked for him. He was just acting as an ordinary member of the public who saw something interesting and was recording it. His intention was thereby to communicate what he recorded to the public. So he was acting as a functional journalist, if we can call that that, if not an institutional journalist. So there's the first point. That's why I've chosen it, because this case indicates that this special Article 10 protection extends not only to those who receive a pension and a salary, but those who do an act which is considered to be useful or relevant in society. The second thing, uh, what does Article 10 apply to? Little footnote about this picture. We've heard a lot since we've been here about the Price Moot Court. This is a picture of the Price Moot Court. <laughs> Um, this is a picture of my investigative journalist students filming the Price Moot Court students as they are waiting to find out who goes to the next line. So, why have I put it in there? It's news gathering. It's in a picture of journalists gathering information which might or might not then subsequently be broadcast. And that's the second thing I see I've run over. I'm going to whiz a bit. Uh, um, and that's the second thing which is relevant here, because this uh, case illustrated that Article 10 applies to acts where journalists are acting in such a way that they never communicate. He gathered information, but he never communicated it. In other words, Article 10 can be seen from this, this, this case to apply to preparatory acts to communication, news gathering. Now, uh, this is the question, the head scratch at the end. So, great. Article 10 applies to uh, people who are not institutional journalists. But then you have a boundary problem. Where do you stop applying it? If you apply it to everybody, then you have a problem, because if everyone is special, then no one is special. So we have a line, and one of the obvious ways of describing where to draw the line about how far this special protection goes is whether someone is reporting in the public interest. But then again, what's the public interest and what's reporting? It may be, as Fred Schauer has argued, that if we uh, extend it, then you just um, defer the problem about line drawings rather than uh, uh, have the artificial drawing about problem about line drawings identifying institutional journalists. 
The second point about how far does it go? Freedom of speech, uh, does it expend, uh, extend to news gathering? Well, as everyone I think in this room knows, it's been extended to freedom of information by the European Court relatively recently. It does look like it's heading towards other activities preparatory to speech too. So in the past 2016-17, I found when I was looking for what cases to try and talk to you about, I found three other out examples. Uh, this isn't a, 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 a thorough survey. And of course, there's Fresno Noir, which goes back a long time, which is a news gathering case. And then I was talking to Jonathan about it, and he said, oh, the MLDI have done a submission uh, about exactly this point. So I threw that one up there, because uh, with the reference as well. So you can talk to Jonathan about the cases he's discovered, which refer to this. But it does seem uh, that the expansion of Article 10 is afoot, uh, both in terms of the people it covers and also what it covers which take, uh, compared with Brandsburg and Hayes, where it doesn't seem to be happening in the US, comparative law point, which Americans can pick me up and tell me I'm wrong about later, um, which takes us back to the future. Um, if it is the case that Article 10 will apply to news gathering, then it might be a uh, tool in the armory of the um, journalists when they fight off this case, if and when it ever reaches the European Court. And so that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things I found very interesting about this case, our friend uh, Dirk Verhoff has written about this, and he said that the court seemed to take into consideration, um, yes, they realized um, that he wasn't officially on assignment, but they looked at his intent and his aim to collect the information and ultimately to release it to mass communications. Um, which uh, brings us round circle to, as I, as I looked at all these individual cases we looked at, there seems to be some common themes that pull it together. One is the vast importance of how technology is changing um, how the courts are looking at this and the types of cases that are coming through, whether or not you have a right of uh, access to information, uh, access to means of communications, whether it's web radio, whether it's um, that you have uh, um, intention to publish information, or whether it's um, the question of getting access to texts that are on a president's wife's cell phone. And and whether or not you have um, the right to publish that kind of information. So again, going back to what Toby said yesterday, we're in an industrial revolution of the next sort, um, and we'll see this kind of play out over and over again. Um, normally at this stage, had I been a much stricter disciplinarian um, and kept us to our 10 minutes, I would ask a number of follow-up questions, such as, um, where do you see these cases in these particular ones that you highlighted? Uh, developing further, what would you, what kind of strategic litigation are you looking forward to? What have been some of the negative cases um, uh, that you're concealing from us, um, uh, from your respective jurisdictions? And finally, what do you see in the future, um, good, bad, or the ugly, in terms of um, cases that are going on? So I'm going to leave that for part of the lunchtime discussion. But I do want to draw in um, two uh, members of our audience, um, uh, uh, Toby, who could talk just a little bit about what um, um, our speaker from Afghanistan, uh, Manir, would have talked about, but first I want to throw it uh, to our speaker from uh, Damas, from Kenya, uh, who shared um, generously several major cases um, yesterday, uh, including um, uh, the striking down of criminal defamation in Kenya and several others, but you have one to share. I think that would be quite interesting if we could do it briefly on um, right to privacy. You can talk from there. Yeah, just turn on the microphone from there. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Yes, um, so um, in the year 2017, uh, Kenya was, was going through an election year. And uh, usually during elections, uh, the, um, the government is really adamant that there's going to be violence. Um, so um, the Communications Authority of Kenya um, sometime in January 2017, issued a warning to journalists and bloggers um, that they should not disseminate uh, uh, fake news, false news, and hate speech. Um, and um, a month later, um, um, uh, mobile operators, that is the major mobile service operators, um, informed uh, the public that they had indeed uh, received a letter from the Communications Authority of Kenya 
uh, directed them to install something called a device management system. Um, the, the operators um, informed uh, the public that this device would allow um, the state to ac access uh, the database to SMSs and, uh, and calls. Uh, so there was obviously um, a concern that this was a form of mass surveillance. Um, uh, and the rejoinder the government said that uh, actually um, this device was just to be used to, uh, to capture counterfeit phones and uh, stolen devices. Um, so um, a, a group of NGOs, including Article 19, uh, moved to court. Um, and basically the argument was that, first of all, there was no public participation. Um, second of all, um, that uh, um, it, it, it threatened the right to privacy. And thirdly, that it also threatened uh, consumer rights. And um, the same judge that struck down um, criminal defamation, Judge Mativo, uh, actually found that uh, there was no semblance of public participation uh, uh, in coming up, to, coming up with this decision to install this device. And uh, that it was indeed, um, um, it, it, would, it would threaten the right to privacy and consumer rights. Mm -hmm. and, and thus uh, it was declared unconstitutional and they were barred from Right. proceeding with this. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and then um, what Toby would like to talk briefly about is that what happens when you're in a, a jurisdiction, a country that doesn't have a lot of media law cases, and how do you make progress um, in freedom of expression um, uh, um, issues and cases and questions that arise? Toby. Thank you. Uh, just before I do that, I would like to say it's a, it's a real shame that Moni is not here uh, and sort of for the worst possible reason that he didn't get a visa. Uh, and I think I can disclose that the upcoming uh, joint declaration of the Special Rapporteurs on Freedom of Expression, which will be released on the 2nd of May, a uh, couple of days from now, will have something about freedom of movement and freedom of expression. Omer kind of tantalizedly uh, dangled that in front of us. Um, and the other thing I, I'd like to say is, I mean, I think uh, you know, it's really good that Afghanistan is somehow being represented here. Uh, you know, most of the countries that have been uh, represented in this meeting so far are larger, more powerful, more developed countries. So I mean, I think it's really important that we, uh, you know, see something from countries like Afghanistan. And uh, you know, I think the popular image of Afghanistan is sort of the basket case with endless war and terrorism and whatever. And there are, you know, it is for the people who live there, it's their normal place of residence in a normal country, and these things are important for them. Um, I talk about two uh, successes. And I think, you know, I mean, I don't, I can't say what Monir would have said because I didn't get to talk to him beforehand or anything, but, uh, you know, th th that I think that on the judicial side, probably not a lot of important things are happening, but quite a lot of things are happening on uh, other sides. And um, the two things I'll talk about is the development of safety mechanism in uh, Afghanistan. So yesterday, in my introductory comments, I mentioned a little bit about uh, safety developments in two countries which hadn't come to fruition, and after, actually Afghanistan is a country where things have moved forward quite nicely. Uh, and what they have done is they have put in place a national coordinating committee, uh, which uh, again, and this, this is the real achievement, I think, that where we're sort of breaking ahead of some of the things that had happened in other countries, which involves at the you know, top level and in a multi, um, uh, you know, thematic dimensional uh, safety mechanism, civil so journalist representatives and civil so other civil society representatives alongside you know, ministries of justice, interior, uh, you know, judicial organs, uh, sort of all of the players. So truly multi-stakeholder uh, representation. And they meet regularly. Um, they operate under a decree, so they have a legal, uh, you know, basis. And they basically, I mean, I, I you know, they're, they're just new, so it's less than a year uh, that they've been operating. But they uh, sort of, you know, send instructions and agree uh, you know, what police should be doing and bring more profile and more coordination. Uh, they create an information flow between the different players because you know, civil society is doing a lot more monitoring of these cases and you know, that isn't connected to the police and investigations. Um, so it's too early to judge how successful it will be, but it's operational, it's going forward. And of course, you know, Afghanistan is a country where there's a lot of killings of journalists, uh, you know, mostly related to the conflict. 
The other thing I'd like to mention about Afghanistan um, is uh, the freedom of information. Uh, a few years ago, they passed a freedom of information law. Uh, on our ranking, it doesn't uh, do uh, very well. Um, and one of the weaknesses in the law, or apparently weaknesses in the law, is the oversight body, the information commission that it establishes is dominated by government actors. So it's not an independent body at all. Uh, and and you know, that's a, a, clearly a weakness. But to my uh, great surprise, when they created the first commission, uh, it turned out to be a great group of people, the officials and the civil society, and the civil society uh, guys kind of took it over. Uh, the, the chair, the deputy chair, and the secretary all were from civil society side. Uh, it was incredibly active. They've been you know, really pushing forward, and uh, among other things, one of the things they've done is they have put amendments to the law uh, which they're, they're claiming to me will put Afghanistan in the top 10 on the RTI rating. I we'll have to see uh, once the law is passed you know, whether that actually happens. Um, and they have been uh, you know, against a sort of an almost disbelieving bureaucracy. They have really been uh, enforcing this right. For example, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, the government fired a minister um, and somebody requested the letter firing him and they said, no, no, this is a secret thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, and they went to the Ministry of Justice and they said, we want to see the letter so that we can assess direct, which they have that power to do. Uh, they, you know, the, the Minister of Justice gave them the letter. They said, there's nothing secret about this. It had nothing in it except the firing uh, and they forced that to be disclosed. They went to the National Assembly again, which sort of said, well, we're, you know, we're, not, we're not even even covered by this law, and they said, yes, you are, uh, and so, so, I mean, it's, you know, it's really encouraging to see uh, these uh, successes out of Afghanistan. Uh, Monir has certainly been involved in all of those things. I don't know whether he would have talked about them, but uh, I will ask him in a few days, because I'm going to Afghanistan. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, we appreciate those comments. So, um, even I am overwhelmed by the smell of food. Um, but I, so what I would like to do at this moment is to encourage whoever feels faint and needs uh, some nourishment, please um, start with the food. But if I would like to open up for questions if anyone would have of the panel or whether panelists have with each other. Yes, Richard. Sorry, it's about uh, South African open justice because I'm fascinated with that because I'm always interested in filming courts. And I might have missed it, I apologize if I did. But what's the rationale given for the constitutional principle? In the common law, uh, as you well know, they rely on Bentham's idea that keeping the judges under trial is an idea. But there's a, comparative, there's a competing idea that it's the people's justice and that there is a kind of deontological reason that people should be able to access it. I'm wondering if the, the constitutional court went into those sort of normative arguments or they just, just got a bit legal. Um, thanks, Richard. No, they, they certainly went into all those arguments and they, they quote Bentham. Uh, publicity is the soul of justice as the starting point, um, and then articulate a number of rationales. Um, the one is that it keeps, again, quoting from an English uh, decision, it keeps the judges, while judging themselves, under trial. Um, so there's the idea of accountability, which is a fundamental principle of our constitution. Um, another rationale that was mentioned was the therapeutic value of the public witnessing how justice is dispensed. And the idea is that you know, rather than fostering gossip and speculation about, for instance, why a particular um, high profile or rich uh, accused, like Oscar Pistorius, for example, might have um, got a, a lenient sentence, which he originally did get from the trial court, you could witness how the judge dispensed justice adjudicated evidence. So there's that therapeutic value for, for the community. Um, and then, um, yes, the general, the general sort of principle which, which has existed since the common law about how, um, how you know, this aids a responsive, accountable uh, democracy. And it's about participation so that you can, uh, through the media, you learn about um, the particulars of cases and can contribute to the participatory democracy through debate and so on. So there's certainly a lot of, and you know, it's, it's an important judgment, not just because of the comparative survey, but also because it does deal with the rationales quite um, quite, quite uh, thoroughly, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience, please? Okay. Yes. 
All right, let's eat. All right, thank you so much. And I do want to thank our speakers for their wonderful presentations and their um, uh, attention to these very, very important cases. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.